Great. Well, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really pleased to be able to um, present on the topic of including restoration practices and rest cultural practices and restoration agendas. Um, and part of what I hope to do today is introduce the work of the cultural practices and ecosystem management thematic group, because uh, we're a fairly new group within SIM um, and have been doing some activities over the last few years that folks may not know about yet and will continue to do so and hope to get others involved. So uh, one of the things that I want to talk about in particular today is, is why cultural practices are important, both in terms of restoration, but also in terms of why we even have a thematic group on cultural practices. What are, what's, what's the point of this? Why is it important? Um, so that'll give me a chance to talk a little bit about this CPIM um, thematic group and what we've been doing. Then I'll discuss specifically some of the cultural practices that are closely linked to restoration concepts and why this is important for restoration. Um, have a couple of case studies, a couple of positive ones and a couple of negative ones that I'll share. Uh, talk about some of the lessons uh, for overall restoration from cultural practices research. And then finally wrap up a little bit with a larger overview of what all this means um, for restoration policy in particular. So that's my hopes for today. Thank you again for having me uh, be part of the webinar series. It's exciting to be here. So I wanna start off with this question of why cultural practices? What are they? What's the point? Why do we focus in on them? Um, and first of all, I think it's important to recognize that culture is a pretty all encompassing term. Uh, it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. And so it's helpful to um, think about it in broad terms because it allows us to see a lot of different activities falling under this overall definition. So UNESCO, the UN body um, that does a lot of work on cultural issues, defines culture as a set of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features of society or a social group. And within that, it can encompass art and literature, lifestyles, living together, community issues, value systems, traditions, and beliefs. Um, so it's a very broad concept, it governs a lot of different things. Um, and it's particularly important to think about culture and cultural practices, the things that the activities that people do to express their culture, to continue to pass on their culture. Uh, important to link that to management of the environment and relations to the environment. Because the relations that people have with their landscapes, with their environment, really encompass not just the physical things they do on land, but the social, spiritual, cognitive, and emotional experiences. Um, so in other words, the connections that people have between themselves and landscapes reflect the importance of different um, cultural elements. And so, you know, these sort of culturally specific worldviews um, both shape people themselves, but also the landscapes itself. Um, and it's important to recognize that there's physical marks in landscapes, um, as this quote from a uh, article a, a couple of years ago points out that you can see these cultural practices through memories, languages, geological and biological features, plant and animal communities, and archeological and paleoecological records. There's a lot of ways to potentially um, see these cultural manifestations uh, on landscapes. So there's increasing recognition of the importance of these cultural practices throughout um, different bodies, not just IUCN. So the uh, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, global assessment that came out in 2019, said explicitly in the summary for policymakers that recognizing knowledge, innovations, practices, institutions, and values of Indigenous peoples and local communities in particular, and including them in environmental governance, can enhance both quality of life and conservation, restoration, and use of nature. Similarly, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the Special Report on Climate Change and Land 
had a similar communication about the importance of decision-making and governance that is enhanced by stakeholder involvement um, of multiple groups uh, and the, the use of their knowledges and practices in the selection, evaluation, implementation, and monitoring of climate change um, adaptation and mitigation. So there's a lot of reasons why we would want to pay attention to cultural practices. And that's part of the reason why this cultural practices and ecosystem management thematic group uh, was set up in 2016 under SIM to help provide some expert knowledge and guidance um, across a variety of areas. So for example, we're looking at the values and roles of culture and these cultural practices in different areas from biodiversity conservation to ecosystem services, um, ecosystem management, and so forth. Um, we're really interested in best practices. You know, how can we potentially um, uh, include cultural practices in restoration agendas, uh, in policy, and so forth? Um, have an increasing focus in our group and thinking about culture in relationship to climate change. That'll be a big uh, part of our next four years um, agenda, how climate change impacts uh, knowledge of, of cultural landscapes and practices, you know, might enable some practices, but constrain others. Um, really thinking about how cultural practices can be part of solutions to ecosystem management and be able to share this with people on the ground and policymakers. So our overall group has about 200 members from around the world. Uh, I urge folks that are interested to um, indicate their interest through the SEM portal. You can say that you wanna join our group and we're very happy um, to have you be part of that. So in terms of what our group is trying to do, um, we're really interested in thinking about um, uh, work that we can be doing across these different uh, 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 areas. So enhancing understanding, so encouraging research, featuring research, that's part of what um, I hope to do in the presentation today. Um, and then doing a better job of disseminating that research um, you know, increasing knowledge of the role that these practices play across different activities, um, assisting with the development of tools and guidance in particular. Um, we're putting together, together a compendium of case studies on best, best practices um, to be able to share those tools and guidance elsewhere. Um, where we can help in the development of policies. We've been trying to do that. So a, a good example is the um, global standard on nature-based solutions that IUCN came up with last year. Um, our group uh, made comments and helped put culture into several of those um, indicators. Um, and we're really uh, you know, gonna try to do more in terms of communication um, in these next four years, maybe more social media and so forth. Um, so, let me talk particularly about the case studies because this is a really important uh, part of uh, what we have been doing and want to continue to do. And I want to urge um, folks that are listening to see if they um, might have case studies that, that can help us. Um, but what we've been trying to do is collect um, very specific case studies of where cultural practices um, and ecosystem management um, are being practiced. Um, so this can include, you know, defining what those cultural practices are, how they relate to ecosystem management, what the different knowledge systems might be, different worldviews that underpin those cultural practices. Um, and particularly, we're interested in, in emphasizing these biocultural approaches. This is a term that um, emphasizes that it's not just uh, ecosystem management is not just the biological, but it has cultural elements as well. So we're really looking at this through a biocultural lens. Um, thinking about maybe case studies that show where cultural sensitivity, awareness and safeguards might have been important, or perhaps negative case studies where cultural practices have been lost because there weren't safeguards, there weren't um, attention, there wasn't attention to cultural identity or languages and so forth. Um, and then hopefully in these case studies showing how well-being, both human well-being as well as resilience of communities and ecosystems can be embedded um, in ecosystem management. 
So if you're interested in helping us write some of these case studies, we had collected a few before the pandemic, pandemic kind of slowed everybody down. We're, we're restarting that again. Um, and so uh, after the webinar, this, these slides will be available as a PDF and there's a link. Uh, you can see both for case study and a template to learn more about what the case studies are and, and what we're looking for. They're very, they're quite brief. Um, so I would really love to, to get some more from folks in the audience if you have um, good case studies that we can feature. Um, and our hope is to put these in a publication and, and help inform those, those um, principles and guidelines. So thanks in advance is able to, to help us with that. So now I wanna talk specifically about restoration and how cultural practices, concepts, and, and concerns intersect with restoration. Um, so there's the, the obvious problem that uh, local communities often rely directly on their immediate environments as places to provision food, water, and so forth um, for basically supplying basic livelihood needs. That's a, an important um, component of why ecosystems are managed to provide human benefits. Uh, of course, degradation can negatively affect those elements. Um, so not just ecological degradation, but often well-being uh, can be lost. Problems with health, uh, problems with sovereignty and land rights, um, access uh, to areas where cultural activities take place. Um, the degradation of the landscape has these effects across a number um, of areas. So it makes sense that when we talk about restoration, we should take advantage of the fact that communities have very close knowledge of their lands and resources that they've been interacting with. Um, oftentimes when we're talking about indigenous communities, there's long histories of embedded cultural practices in landscapes. Um, and communities have a vested interest in restoring ecosystems from which they directly benefit. Um, and I'll in my case studies that I'll talk about in a few minutes, there are a lot of cultural benefits from restoration um, that can be included in the reasoning and the goals and objectives for restoration. This can include, for example, language revitalization, provisioning of culturally important foods and so forth. Um, but despite this fact that culture really can help inform restoration and, it's, and it can be very mutually reinforcing, um, all too often there's examples of decision-making about restoration, which privilege biological importance and integrity over some of these other concerns. And so our hope is through some of these case studies, we can really show that there's, there's multi-objective benefits um, from restoration and that successful restoration can often feed off of successful cultural restoration as well. So an important component of this is recognizing that communities are already uh, doing cultural practices that have restoration um, intersections, but they might not be recognized as restoration per se. So examples of this include anthropogenic burning. Um, lots of uh, indigenous communities, for example, um, will purposefully use burning to alter you know, spatial or temporal aspects of habitats um, to create biodiversity in different zones at different time periods. Um, there's practices relating to waste deposition, uh, which ends up enriching soil carbon. Agricultural systems often have a restoration component in them, particularly if they're rotational and they include uh, maintaining forest cover and plant diversity in different zones. Um, manual of useful plants, particularly culturally important ones, um, weeding and cleaning to maintain resilience. These are all things that sort of regularly go on um, and often are driven by cultural concerns to have culturally important food, uh, for example. Um, but these practices aren't necessarily recognized as restoration per se. So part of including cultural practices is, is looking at them um, through a restoration lens and recognize them where they, they take place. Um, there's also a lot of examples of indigenous communities um, leading or partnering in formal restoration activities that are called such. Um, oftentimes this is essentially restoring lands that were degraded by others. Um, so the, the sort of added labor, um, even though the degradation took place um, for, for outside of the community. Um, so there's all sorts of examples 
of how traditional fire regimes um, have been used um, for restoration uh, in California, for example. There's some great examples in Alaska, um, coastline uh, uh, restoration, particularly where it's been affected by ocean pollution, oil spills, and so forth, um, has been really important. Um, restoration efforts led by indigenous peoples and local community, um, particularly on the peri-urban areas have been important in terms of um, helping to, to halt landscape change uh, in some cases. Um, and I really wanna emphasize this last, which is that restoration efforts um, in and of themselves often create a change in the political context. It allows local communities, particularly indigenous communities, to often create a space for assertion of indigenous spiritual and cultural values when they are embedded in restoration programs. And this can have really important upscaling effects. Uh, so for a, to give an example, if a community is involved in a restoration project, it can help um, strengthen claims that they might be late making in say a, a legal court about um, the, the right to legal recognition of their lands being embedded in or having examples of restoration can strengthen those claims. Um, and so there's a lot of mutual benefit that can be gained from um, paying attention to the role of culture and cultural practices through restoration. It's, it's really a two way street um, if done well. So as I've mentioned, really one of the key things here is to think about biocultural restoration as multi objective. Um, and this is a quote from uh, a paper that's a real model for how this is done, uh, uh, where the, the authors write that, you know, in contrast to ecological integrity driven biodiversity restoration, restoration goals of indigenous peoples often accentuate the importance of human agency and connection with the environment. This worldview is shaped by cultural institutions, norms, genealogy and ethics, and natural resource use. Um, so the work of uh, Phil Liver and many of his colleagues in New Zealand is a role model um, for how these cultural practices um, can be embedded uh, in restoration um, so that there's a multi-objective benefit. You get ecological integrity, but you also get um, that important connection of human agency um, with the restored landscapes. So I wanna talk about a couple of case studies. Um, and these are mostly um, drawn from existing published literature. Uh, so the case studies that we've done so far in CPIM, we've actually had um, not very many on restoration. So that's why I was really happy to uh, get a chance to talk to this group today and see if we can get um, some of those case studies written specifically for us. Um, so I'm using these from um, broader studies that have been done from literature to give an example of the sorts of things that we'd like to uh, potentially feed uh, in, our, in our case study work. Um, so the first case study to talk about uh, is the work that the Tulalip tribes have been doing in the Pacific Northwest of the US on salmon restoration. Um, and this was a problem both from a biological point of view um, in terms of declining uh, populations of salmon, but it had a cultural element because salmon was particularly important for cultural practices, food provisioning and local economies, you know, such as um, uh, and tourism and so forth. Um, so the Tulalip tribes initiated what they call the sustainable land strategy. And it was aimed at building resilience um, across the landscape um, and a really involved cooperative planning and at the basin scale. So it was really um, required partnering with, with folks outside of um, the, the tribal lands themselves, but to really think about partnerships to generate um, and sustained health of both fish themselves in the runs, but the, the nearby farming communities that were often um, on the, the banks of the, the rivers that were important. Um, there was also a need to improve flood control. Um, this was a, a real concern of some of the local landowners um, to build in support for tribal culture and traditional knowledge 
um, and to tackle environmental quality as well. So it's really multi-objective um, through the sustainable land strategy. So one of the key restoration uh, interventions that was selected was to establish riparian buffers as a sort of living fence along um, landowners' farms where the salmon corridors. And this ended up serving multiple purposes. The trees themselves that were planted served as a sort of defensive barrier against damage to farms um, from debris during floods and so forth. So it uh, helped with flood control. Um, but it also, of course, helped protect river habitat um, for the salmon themselves. Um, and one of the ways that this uh, multi-stakeholder partnership uh, was able to integrate both science and indigenous knowledge was through using tools like ecosystem services modeling, but embedding in that um, meetings among local indigenous knowledge holders with local experts um, from universities and so forth. Um, and it was really iterative. It was building in indigenous knowledge and, and trying to incorporate it in this more formal ecosystem modeling um, uh, practice. And they used it to create a narrative document. Uh, and that narrative document, uh, which provided citations to the scientific literature as well, but it really set a framework for what scenarios and what management decisions would be important in this multi-stakeholder um, process. So to give another example of a case study where cultural practices and cultural knowledge was embedded in restoration um, comes from Okahu Bay, um, which is outside of Auckland, uh, New Zealand or uh, Itaroa. And the problem here was that a, a, a sewer pipe had been built in the early 20th century, which was diverting hospital and industrial rate waste from Auckland city itself out to this bay, which had been a very important tidal estuary. And the untreated wastewater and the medical waste and so forth was incredibly uh, polluting. And so the bay really went from being what was known as a, a food pantry, a pataka, for the local uh, Maori community to just really an unusable um, water body. And so restoration activities began over a, a decade ago. And the key decision was made very early on to use Maori indicators for ecological health rather than strictly biological ones. Um, and it was summed up in this phrase that a healthy bay um, has our fanau in it. And by fanau, it, it means people, has our people in it. Um, and so the, the, the indicators of health of the bay were whether or not people could walk in it, swim in it, fish in it, connect with it, and so forth. So it was really embedded in a cultural sense of um, ties and reciprocity with the water. So then the, the catchment uh, ecological restoration plan explicitly in, included strategies for restoring Maori or the sort of life force um, of the Bay itself um, through indigenous ecological knowledge, um, Mataranga. And part of this, a really important component was including the education of school children. Um, because it allowed uh, the, the ability to bring in um, language revitalization um, for the Maori language to school kids, as well as serving as science education. They were able to take kids out to the bay, involve them in monitoring um, as regular practice through uh, local schools. So that was a really key component of the restoration plan. And interestingly, part of the restoration included um, bringing in green-lipped mussel for bioremediation of the, the polluted state of the bay. Um, and green-lipped mussel was an introduced species. Um, so the, the baseline indicators were not necessarily some sort of historic baseline from the past, but except there was an acceptance of an introduced species because it met cultural indicators as well as being able to help with the water quality issues. And so those cultural indicators, as I said, you know, included that people were able to benefit from being in the bay. Um, and traditional weavers were brought in to braid ropes for the mussels for which 
um, the the uh, spat, the, the baby uh, seeds could, could then develop. So now I'd like to give an example of a negative <laughs> case study where, where restoration went wrong because it didn't pay attention uh, to cultural practices. So this is a case from Gujarat, India, where there was a top-down approach to restore urban uh, ponds. And these ponds were seen as providing vital functions, including water uh, retention, water storage, groundwater recharge, um, and sewage treatment as well. But the real concern that these ponds were diminishing in size because they were um, being built up uh, due to land reclamations around the edges. So in Navarsi city, uh, there was a focus by the city government to restore these urban water bodies using a couple of indicators chosen by city managers, uh, particularly drinking water, nature conservation, aesthetics, and recreation. So unfortunately, because it didn't involve a stakeholder process, it was very top down, there was a real exclusion of other activities that were taking place in these ponds. Um, and one of the activities that was taking place um, were domestic activities um, that reflected cultural relationships um, to water. And this included the fact that some of these ponds were the only places where um, cast members of the washing class, the folks who, who do laundry for others, it was their only source of water. Um, and so a restoration project that included their values of you know, having a place to wash clothes might have, for example, included um, a focus on piped water in a separate area or the installation of water stations um, uh, someplace else. Didn't happen. What happened was that ponds were completely fenced in. They were partly lined with trees. Um, and anybody living on the edges was essentially resettled. So the community that had been using the ponds for washing lost jobs, um, fishers lost access to the fish in the ponds and community ties were lost as well because folks were dispersed. So it's a real example of where restoration can um, focus on certain values to the exclusion of others with very negative livelihood and cultural um, outcomes. So we want to ideally move from problematic approaches to restoration to much more positive ones. And, and I think there's a very strong case to be made for cultural practices as, as being part of that process. So as the India case study uh, showed, top-down restoration with low levels of local participation often results in conflicts over landscape visions. That's not a surprise um, to anybody who works in restoration. Um, and another problem is that even when local communities are involved in restoration, all too often it might be just for labor or for providing land. And that can be economically and culturally problematic. And it really misses out on the opportunity to link multiple objectives across cultural and economic values. So a more positive version would be to include cultural elements, such as revitalizing local traditions, languages, recognizing that there are cultural differences among stakeholders. Um, and that can help promote understanding of restoration efforts in the local area and increase participation and success. Um, but part of that is also recognizing that there, there will be conflicting values such around as around you know, what is degradation, who's degradation, um, and what cultural and livelihood practices are most valued is, is going to vary and may be conflictual. <coughs> so ensuring that restoration projects receive technical and financial support, not just for the biological components, but also for well-being and cultural practices, having that multi-objective focus can potentially help ensure long-term benefits. So I'd like to, in my last uh, 10 minutes or so, some, some lessons that I think we can see um, from case studies that are out there about cultural practices. Um, 
The first one is the importance of engaging pluralistic values and knowledge. There is a lot of evidence that indigenous and local knowledge um, and cultural practices can help in planning of restoration from the very beginning. So in terms of uh, as the New Zealand uh, and Pacific Northwest case studies showed, when cultural practices are embedded from the beginning through knowledge and values to help set, sort of shape the stage for the development of plans and so forth, uh, the, the benefits can really be realized uh, more explicitly. So this can range from, you know, using local knowledge to identify what species to use, maybe a particular focus on those with cultural importance around foods and, and festivals and so forth. Um, take advantage of long-term experience with local successional and regeneration processes could help determine sites, you know, where restoration needs to be more active, where it could be more passive, places that might be more culturally important, where cultural keystones uh, are prominent. Um, these can all be uh, part of the process from early on. Using cultural information such as embedded and oral histories can help make restoration decisions regarding baseline conditions. You know, the New Zealand case study points out Introduced species may be part of uh, a, a needed part of a restoration program, um, but it really depends on what the local values uh, are oriented towards. Um, and finally, using ecological restoration and linking it to cultural restoration, for example, the New Zealand case study where passing on of knowledge to school children was a, was a key uh, component of the project that can be a really powerful incentive um, for really sustained engagement. So the second lesson is to really ensure that stakeholder involvement takes into account those cultural practices. So, you know, everybody hammers on about engagement in restoration. And in this case, we really wanna emphasize that engagement is more um, than just, you know, having meetings, but it's really taking into account um, engagement as, as a sort of long-term relation of care, um, that this needs to go on, um, you know, involve stakeholder analysis and mapping and so forth from the beginning and multiple mechanisms for engagement. This might involve say unstructured spaces, dialogue exchange and so forth. Um, and the keys to doing this well are really about establishing trust, um, communicating inclusively, promoting social learning, you know, this is a long-term process. It's not a one-off. Um, but there, you know, the, the literature points out that there can be dangers um, to be aware of, that stakeholder fatigue is a real thing, um, that collective participation and the sort of real deep and sustained engagement that is needed um, takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of labor um, and it, it's more effort. Um, and the, the payoff can be greater, but one has to be aware that you know, there are real barriers um, at the beginning because of uh, time commitments and, and this problem of fatigue and so forth. So it's good to build those concerns in early. A third lesson is to really think about co-production of indicators and objectives, again, from very early on. Um, because oftentimes there's, uh, maybe a nod to social indicators um, in restoration projects, but they might not be local understandings of well-being, right? So indicators of, of rises in income, that might not be the most important local indicator of well-being. Um, and so making sure that indicators reflect um, cultural understanding um, can be a really important tool. Um, and so some of these cultural values might include um, the idea of reciprocity between and nature, um, the fact that uh, relations with nature are often seen in, in kin terms um, of, of kinship relationships, and thinking about how to embed these in local leaders, um, as happened in the New Zealand case study, um, can really show these sort of mutual ties between culture uh, and the environment. Um, a focus on cultural ecosystem services can really resonate strongly um, within res uh, restoration plans. 
um, particularly around the idea of recovering sense of identity, of pride, building support for the project when it has that focus on culture in it. Um, and then monitoring of projects can obviously make use of uh, traditional knowledge and locally derived indicators, cultural keystone species, uh, key cultural places and so forth um, as the sites where long-term monitoring is emphasized um, could be particularly important. So a fourth lesson is the importance of rights um, and including in this cultural rights, the right to um, continue and perpetuate one's culture. Um, and so safeguards uh, really should be in place for large scale restoration projects to make sure um, that there aren't adverse consequences um, on culture or well being. Um, and it's also really important to potentially embed what might be a fairly local restoration project with larger scales and rights. Um, the good example is the Pacific Northwest salmon case where um, the, the Tulalip knew that they couldn't just focus on their lands because it needed to be basin wide. Um, and so that was included in the planning. And there are other examples where scaling up to um, watershed basin wide approaches actually helps um, restore land rights. It can in, you know, help in cases where people might be in court or trying to document practices that establish land rights. So a restoration project can actually fit into legal and cultural agendas of, of local places as well and strengthen um, rights, which have, have been so much in the news recently, the importance of tenurial rights, particularly for indigenous peoples. And restoration can, could be a great tool for helping achieve some of that. Um, it's also important to recognize that adverse cultural outcomes are among the least recognized of negative outcomes um, of projects. So loss of knowledge, loss of access to sites for cultural activities and so forth, these are often not documented. Um, and so we need to pay more attention to those. We need to pay attention to the fact that inequalities, trade-offs, um, may change over time and not everyone is equally affected. Um, so there's this need to have a long-term lens on assessment and then adjustment over time. Um, and it requires patience. Um, it requires systematic processes where possible. Um, and ways to think about doing that include formal mechanisms. Obviously pre-prior informed consent is, is a formal mechanism types of safeguards, grievance mechanisms, dialogue opportunities, um, respecting obligations for consultation, having rights to appeal. There's all sorts of mechanisms that may be appropriate for different situations, um, but, but recognizing that there are rights as part of this uh, is important. So what are some larger conclusions? What are the implications for larger restoration policy from this? I think there's a couple that are worth mentioning. This um, is to be more explicit about cultural practices um, within these larger efforts. So whatever happens to be the successor to IHE target 15 in the post um, agenda when that's finalized next spring, um, having more attention to culture within that um, could be really important. It's also, it would be great to do a better job of keeping track of, of where indigenous peoples and local communities are really driving restoration efforts and where cultural practices have been successful. Um, there's no great database to go to now. And so I don't know if um, folks working you know, through the, the UN system on the decade on restoration through the bond challenge and so forth, there's some way to do a better job of collecting these examples and knowing where they are. Um, I think that would help make the case um, for cultural practices in restoration as well. Um, I think being explicit about this idea of biocultural approaches um, can really help support many of these cultural practices. Um, because what it essentially comes down to is, is this, I think, great quote from um, Phil Liver and his colleagues that restoration's benefits to people and community are as significant 
as reparations of ecological components, that there's a really mutually beneficial um, component when it's done well. Um, and that's what we hope to uh, encourage more of through hopefully CPIM's efforts and uh, through the Ecological Restoration Thematic Group um, and activities in other places as well. So in the uh, PDF, which will be available afterwards, I have some other examples of um, uh, great uh, places where people are doing these culturally embedded uh, restoration projects that we can really learn uh, a lot from. Um, and I think I'll end there and, and potentially open it up to some questions. Thank you so much, Pamela, for that excellent presentation. And as you highlighted, the social, cultural, economic, human dimensions of restoration are clearly as important as the ecological one, yet often that conversation is in the background rather than in the foreground. So your contribution here today is very much appreciated and really important. We do have lots of questions that have come in. I'll give you an easy one first. How can people get involved in your thematic group? It's very easy. Um, so Sim has a, a website um, that with a portal that says, you know, get involved. Uh, and um, actually maybe, I don't know if we can put that in the chat uh, what the overall website portal is. Um, and send in a CV, indicate your interest in our group. Uh, we'd love to have you. It's a very simple process. Uh, basically, you know, being part of the volunteer efforts in IUCN uh, is a great way to network, meet other people, um, hear what's happening in other places. Um, you know, we ask people maybe have a few hours a month to help us do various activities, sharing information, doing webinars like this. Um, but I think the, the benefits far outweigh the the, the time commitment and I hope folks get, get involved. Love to have you. Okay, and I'm putting in the chat right now to everyone, there we go. Okay, fantastic. Um, all right, so opening up my question page here. Um, We'll start with a couple that are related to sort of best practices. Here's one from Hillary. Perhaps as CEM, we should not drift away from applying the 12 principles of the ecosystem approach. The Indian example obviously did not apply principles 1, 11, 12 at least. Does the CPEM deliberately apply the ecosystem approach and its principles? And I expect many people here are not aware of which principle one, 11 and 12 is of the ecosystem approach, but I think it's a larger question. So I'll broaden it um, to say, you know, we kind of have best practices within CM, the ecosystem approach has been elaborated. Are we applying those principles in general? And if not, what can we do to improve that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, a, a great point that, um, you know, it was, it was a negative example, not just for the, the cultural element, but because it didn't sort of conform to best practices of restoration in general. Um, and so that, I think, points out um, to me that there, um, there's both like lose, lose, lose propositions as well as a potential for win-win um, when we're not uh, thinking about culture and ecosystem restoration together uh, in these uh, reinforcing ways. So I wouldn't say, you know, one of our jobs as CPEM is, is um, you know, not to apply it ourselves, but to help provide some, some guidance to folks who are in the field um, doing things. And that's our hope with um, doing a better job of coming up with some guidance and principles from CPEM, you know, where people are in a situation where they're not sure um, how cultural practices are important or how they can be in, in um, what folks are already doing for restoration. And so that's our hope if we can do these sort of case studies and spread the word and, and, and help link then um, to the, the, the 12 principles that are already there, um, we will have done hopefully our job in, in raising awareness and seeing where those intersections are. So that's our hope. 
Um, and, and again, please <laughs> help us do that um, by becoming involved. That would be great. Thanks. So Anthony is on a similar theme and he is asking what needs to be done in situations where the local people do not have control and power to manage their own ecosystem, yeah. say wetlands, yet the government, which has ultimate control of such wetlands, is using them for projects that do not resonate well with the local communities and they are being degraded at a large scale. Yeah, it's, it's often problematic. And that's why I was saying, you know, one angle um, that restoration that's, that's attentive to cultural practices can help provide is making the case for um, local uh, management of lands. You know, this example that was given about wetlands, if, if they're being degraded because of the lack of um, you know, local ability to make decisions, um, then perhaps where restoration has um, shown that those that local community can do a good job, um, can provide the impetus for the government going, you know what, yeah, I, it is working, let's, let's evolve, let's not use it just as state managed lands. And there, there are good examples of that, where that has happened, that um, using restoration projects as a way to um, get recognition. It's happened in the United States, for example, there, there have been um, folks that have not been federally recognized. Um, thinking about links to land as a way to get federal recognition um, and get legal recognition of land rights. Um, so this can be a mutually beneficial tool. Is it going to work everywhere? You know, some states are very reluctant to give um, tenurial rights for different reasons. Um, but, but I think a strong argument can be made that a, a, a well-designed restoration project could help in those cases. Great, thank you. Oh, there's so many good questions um, coming in. I am gonna go to Robert's question. Uh, Robert says, there are clearly excellent qualitative data from specific case studies. But has anyone done systematic and global survey of motivations and barriers to restore actions by rural communities by reaching out to them at random in their own? Yeah, I mean, we would love to do that as part of this case study work. I think you've hit the nail on the head, which is uh, it's it's very dispersed. Um, you know, we'll do what we can through the CPIM work. Um, but that was my point at I would love to see, um, you know, folks that are involved in the bond challenge or the, the UN decade on restoration. Is, is there a place where this can be collected um, at higher levels and, and used to inform the activities place over the next decade? That would, that would be great. That would be ideal um, because the answer is no, it's quite dispersed right now. And Pooja has complimented uh, Robert's comment question by saying, do we have a compilation portal anywhere to mm -hmm. access case studies that highlight the success of ecosystem restorations in collaboration with key stakeholders that signifies the importance of local community involvement? And I'll, you sort of answer that, I'll ask you for comment, but I'll first say that one of the really powerful aspects of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration is harnessing the global uh, movement and providing information. And there is a best practices task force and a monitoring task force. And the best practices task force is working on compiling and making accessible in one place links to best practice uh, polls, whether or not uh, cultural, socioeconomic um, projects or projects, you know, that have emphasized those aspects are included. I don't know, but I would encourage all interested to join the decade on ecosystem restoration and, in particular, highlight this need. And uh, Pamela, any? comment? Yeah, just reinforcing, yeah, that, that's going to be really crucial. And, and in as much as we have those examples that come from, you know, either our work in IUCN or elsewhere to, to feed into 
um, that sort of uh, approach of best practices, then I think all the better. Okay, I want to, it's a similar theme, but it's on monitoring. Um, and this is from Anup. And uh, Anup says, kindly enlighten me with methods of value, uh, valuing the cultural services provided by wetland ecosystems, except the travel cost method. <laughs> Besides, what are the indicators that should be followed during evaluating the cultural evaluating cultural services and its accounting. You mentioned being more explicit about cultural practices. Do you have good examples of monitoring the socio-cultural benefits of restoration? Uh, this is me adding on, either in terms of a framework or an actual project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the it, it's difficult to say, here's the way to do it, because one of the the things we want to emphasize is, is different values inform different practices. And mm -hmm. so there's no template to do exactly one way. Um, but part of it is being aware where tools um, may be inappropriate. Um, so a great example is cost benefit analysis, um, sort of constantly is in a battle with um, thinking sure because so much of what's important and valued through cultural ecosystem services and cultural practices is non-monetary. Non um, and so that's a constant struggle um, to think about ways to bring in cultural indicators and cultural values when a framework for a project is cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> and so <laughs> just a flag that, you know, where we can um, think of alternatives, then that's, you know, a, a, the direction that we're moving in. Um, so I'll just say as somebody who works a lot on ecosystem services, there's been a real move in the last couple years in particular towards um, what are known as deliberative valuation techniques. Um, and so there's some that are more quantitative, so some are more qualitative, um, but they basically involve uh, much more deliberation um, sort of working through um, where different values are in, in conflict, um, you know, how can we express preferences that are not monetary preferences. So this is a whole area of, of active work. Um, so I would urge people to kind of keep an eye on that. Um, hopefully in some of our case studies, we'll, we'll have a couple of examples of uh, what the deliberative techniques are, how they might be used um, in restoration and, and elsewhere that I think would be helpful. Um, but those, those are the sorts of things that I think are important to stress that there's multiple non-monetary ways to value. There's multiple ways um, to do um, monitoring that use local indicators. They're, they aren't indicators that are selected from a pre-existing framework, but they might you know, be generated locally and reflect those local um, concerns and values. Great, thank you. And I wanna remind all of the participants that if you have a question, put it in the Q&A, not the chat, because I can't multitask to that extent to be pulling them from the chat. And if you have shared in the Q&A resources, apologies, but please do type those into the chat so everyone can see them. Um, I, I saw um, from Robert and um, Jonathan, um, and some other, some resources that went directly into the Q&A. And I'm going to go to um, a sort of new topic here. We're at the uh, global level with our, you know, ambitious global targets, platforms, and initiatives. And Becca says, with countries that are signatories to the UN, you find that they take UN resolutions, but only implement what they want while omitting what they don't agree with. In terms of the UN resolutions at the Rio Earth Summit. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. in, in, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I thought that that was, I was, I don't think that's a question yet. <laughs> okay, hold on. It's a little bit long, but I think it's important for this context. So in terms of the UN resolutions at Rio Earth Summit, Indigenous peoples are recognized and their ways of living are to be respected. The issues of protecting Native biodiversity and setting Native biodiversity targets is also mentioned, but countries choose to recognize only the biodiversity aspect and not the Indigenous peoples aspect. Mm -hmm. It's conflict, resentment, and divisions. 
Here's the question. How do we address this when implementing large scale ecosystem restoration? Y yeah, um, you've hit the nail. It's often dependent on um, the ability to maneuver within these larger political systems. Um, and of course, we see this going out right, going on right now, this whole week um, with the opening of the biodiversity COP. Um, one of the big um, sticking points in the post 2020 framework has been around um, land tenure and indigenous people's rights um, with concerns that the current framework does not adequately reflect those. Um, and even if it were to, you have the problem that the commenter pin which is trees may sign up to these and then there's no formal obligation to actually enforcement to, to ensure that this happens on the ground. Um, and it can make it very challenging um, when folks want to have this real engagement with cultural and, and um, other important issues when there isn't an overarching legal framework that helps that. Um, and so I mentioned that in some cases, um, groups that had not been formally recognized as indigenous have been able to use the restoration project as an argument for their cultural identity and uniqueness and ties to land, which enforces land claims. Um, so, you know, even if the, if the overall framework may not be there, sometimes the bottom up stuff can help urge that overall legal framework to happen. Um, you know, I, but I don't want to downplay the fact that it can be enormously challenging, um, particularly for indigenous land defenders. The last decade has been devastating in terms of violence and um, murders of, of folks that have been trying to protect and restore lands. And so th there's, there's real barriers. There's real barriers. There's no two ways about it um, that have to, we have to see those and recognize those and, and, and work within them as best we can. But also I think with that, that culture and, and ecological indicators can be mutually reinforcing it is a pretty strong argument. Um, and the more we make it, maybe we can, you know, move those, those larger structures as, you know, even just incrementally, I think helps. Wow, that was a great and inspiring way to end an excellent hour. I am gonna put in the chat again, um, just contact information, information on how you can watch and download this video or subscribe to get alerts to when videos get posted as part of the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group webinar series. Thank you so much, Pamela for sharing your time and expertise with us and taking us on a little journey of infusion of restoration with cultural practices. Thanks to all of you for participating. Uh, we have a great community going. I appreciate everyone sharing in the chat. Uh, please do contact Brock and I if you want information or if we can help. And if you're new to the series, come back and join us next month. We will be announcing the full calendar for the next calendar year, sometimes towards the start of uh, December. So thanks so much. We'll see you all next month. Stay in touch, stay healthy, and take care of yourselves and your families. Bye-bye. There were, uh, Pamela, lots of, uh, I didn't read them, but in the Q&A, lots of congratulations on a nice presentation. Oh, good. And um, people are just still signing off. We've still got about 60 folks um, online. Like to leave it open for a little bit so people yeah. download from the chat. Um, and is it possible to get a copy of the chat? Because I wasn't, I wasn't able to monitor it very well. And I think people may have been putting in some examples that we could really uh, yeah, use. Yeah, and there, there were quite a few interesting questions too that I wasn't able to get to. I kind of jumped around and tried to pick the bigger themes, but we, um, Brock can share all of that with you. And you can see in the chat, people put their institutional affiliations. Mm -hmm. And there were a few people who, um, uh, said that this was really relevant, especially to their thesis work. Good.
Um, and so if we share the chat, then you can get the email addresses for right. those too. So, oh, Kara, someone has disabled copy function in the chat. Um, okay, so for those interested in getting access to the chat, email Brock. And if you scroll up in the chat, you'll see his email. Um, or I can just put my email. Again, I already included it, but here's my email. And uh, let me know if you want to get in touch with Pamela or if you want a copy of the chat. And I'd be happy to uh, contact Brock, who is our web webinar master. And All right. I'm going to close out. Enjoy the week. Bye-bye. Glad to be here. Thanks.